Good evening. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's event, Nature Versus Nurture, Unpacking X and Y. I'm Maeve Martin, the General Manager of Humanities 21, and I'm delighted to be introducing this event, which is the first in our bi-monthly series with the Melbourne Museum. And the event series is called Creating Space for Relevant Debate. And the objective of this series is to highlight important issues and then create a discussion that is both respectful and multifaceted around those issues. The Melbourne Museum has been a fantastic partner for us to work with in creating this event series um, because the museum takes so seriously its role as an educator in our community. Uh, I think it is fitting for us to remember, since we're all gathered here in this lecture theatre tonight, that the land we're gathered on has been used as a space for sharing of ideas and communication since long before it was known as Melbourne, or the Melbourne Museum even. With that in mind, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional custodians of this land. I pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and to anyone who is in the auditorium with us this evening, um, pay my respect to those members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community as well. As I mentioned earlier, this event series has the purpose of exploring issues that affect our community in a profound way. Tonight's topic engages with polemics surrounding sex and gender, which is highly topical, and our panel of experts will explore this issue in uh, many different ways. Before we begin the discussion, however, I would like to mention that tonight we're running a social media competition. The winner of, uh, the, sorry, there will be three winners of double passes to Nocturnal on Friday the 6th of July at the Melbourne Museum. Nocturnal is a fantastic event where they have uh, drinks and food and music and all of the museum's permanent exhibitions are open. It's a fantastic way of revisiting and enjoying the museum as an adult. So all you have to do is like us or follow us on one of our social media channels and the links are up there on the screen behind me and we'll announce those at the end of tonight. I think it's about time we introduced the moderator for tonight's event, which is Jan McGuinness, who is the Vice President of Humanities 21. Please join me in welcoming Jan McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Maeve, and good evening, everyone. Uh, and, very, and a big warm welcome on this cold night to uh, Humanities 21 panel discussion on nurture versus nature, unpacking X and Y which you'll find we're taking a very uh, broad approach to, both in um, subject matter and in our definitions, I guess, of nature and nurture. Last year's uh, plebiscite on same-sex marriage gave rise to much discussion around questions of equality for the LGBTQI community. But while we may have moved forward in a civic sense by voting overwhelmingly in favour of same-sex marriage, do we really understand issues of gender and gender identity which continue to exercise feminists, let alone members of the LGBTQI community. Tonight's panel discussion is an attempt to contextualise these issues by probing some of their socio-political, medical and scientific underpinnings. By no means definitive, we hope, however, to broaden our understanding. So here we have our three panellists. First we'll hear from Dr Lauren Rosewarne, who will address the political and social aspect of gender and gender roles. Sitting next to her is Professor Vincent Harley, who will describe his research into the genetic triggers of intersexuality and on establishing a biological basis for gender identity. Then Diane Bray from Museum Victoria will take us into the natural world of fish, where changing sex and gender roles is a reproductive su survival strategy. Each of our experts, uh, speakers, will talk for about 10 minutes, followed by a panel discussion, after which I will throw questions open to the floor. So let's commence by introducing Dr. Lauren Rosewarn, who is a senior lecturer in the School of Political and Social um, Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Dr. Rosewarn writes, researches and comments on sexuality, gender, feminism, the media, pop culture, public policy and politics. She co-hosts Stop Everything on Radio National and the Sealed Section podcast and has authored nine books. Please welcome her. So what do we mean when we talk about gender and gender studies? Uh, I teach three gender studies and sexual politics courses per year at the University of Melbourne. 
This evening I'm going to cram 30 weeks of lectures <laughs> into, 10, uh, into 10 minutes. So if I speak quickly, that's the excuse that I'm offering up. It's important to start the, the discussion distinguishing between two concepts, sex and gender. So by sex, we basically mean biology, hormones, chromosomes, the bodily things that mark us as commonly, but not always, men or women. This of, this, of course, all gets easily muddled. It gets muddled when paperwork asks unnecessarily, usually, but nonetheless, what your sex is when they usually mean what your gender is. Equally, it gets muddled when we talk about not only gender, but sex existing on a spectrum. And as the next speaker will address, the notion of not merely gender being fluid, but sex perhaps being a little more than binary. Gender I like to think of as a performance, as what's done with sex, either in compliance with it, in opposition to it, or without an agenda at all. Commonly, it manifests in doing or being masculine or feminine, wearing the right clothes, having the right haircut, wearing the genital appropriate perfume or aftershave, buying the pink or the blue disposable razor. In our culture, we're rewarded for towing the line and following the gendered mandates of our birth sex. Alternatively, we're punished for deviating in a society that doesn't really like difference. These gender performances are happening on individual levels but they are decisions that are influenced by broader cultural views on gender as well. In our culture, different genders are ascribed different qualities. We think again generally of women as nurturers, as softer, as kinder, as more emotional than men. We think of women as being at the mercy of nature, of our bodies, of our bleeding, and as generally more hormonal and, and less rational than men. men we think of as strong, as providers, as level-headed, as reasonable. We associate women with the home and men with the public sphere. Of course, in practice, there is much blurring here. But we nonetheless often speak differently about people who depart from the expectations of their gender when we use labels like male primary school teacher, male nurse, or female police officer, or female pilot. We draw attention to what we consider culturally aberrant uh, gender behaviour, even if it's not a conscious effort at being discriminatory. Gender studies explores these issues. I've been asked to talk about some key issues in gender studies, so I've picked four to cram into my remaining seven minutes. One, gender discrimination. Gender discrimination occurs when someone is treated less well or outright badly based on their gender. This encompasses things such as the gender pay gap and women's lifetime earnings being, on average, less than men's in most places in the world. It involves negative speculation about why a man might want to work in childcare or in a primary school. It involves women's pain not being taken seriously in the doctor's office. It involves cultural practices like female genital mutilation and honour killings. It involves someone not getting a job because they are transgender. It involves restricting a transgender employee's interactions with customers. It involves a lack of provision of gender neutral bathrooms. All of these things are examples of practices of discrimination based on gender. Most of these are in varying capacities legislated against in Australia, but like rape, like murder, like sexual harassment, Having laws against these things doesn't stop them completely. They continue partly because our culture allows them to continue. Two, gender violence. I mentioned a moment ago that there are cultural practices like female genital mutilation that happen because of gender. More broadly, there are a deluge of violent acts that happen to people on the basis of gender. More, more broadly, women uh, and people presenting as feminine are more likely to be the victims of sexual assault, sexual harassment, domestic violence. One could argue that there's a biological component to this, women often being smaller, less strong, less in possession of aggressive testosterone, but much more interesting are the cultural, social and political aspects to this. Think about the amount of attention that the media gives to horrible but nonetheless incredibly isolated examples of women being harmed in public space. 
Public space, after all, is a place women aren't supposed to be. Certainly not after dark, certainly not in a park, certainly not unchaperoned. Contrast this with the one woman per week who was killed in Australia by a man she knows and has probably been intimate with. Because we have a different view of violence happening in the home. It's not as though we tolerate it, we don't. But it's not a media event. There's very rarely candlelight vigils for victims of domestic violence, nor are they take back the home marches. Partly that's about how common domestic violence is and partly because it's one of those things that happens as background noise to women in a culture that is unequal. While women are victims of gender, gender violence doesn't just happen to them. If we look at data on the LGBTIQ population, they are disproportionately the victim of street harassment, public violence, school and workplace bullying. This population, consequently, have higher rates of depression and suicide compared to the rest of the population. Sure, we can say that part of this stems from factors like marginalisation underpinned by puritanical views on sex, sure. And part of it is because people who are, for example, homosexual or transgender, are often deemed to deviate from the expectations related to both sex and gender. That harassment and bullying and violence occurs because same-sex attraction, alternatively, to not participate in the work associated with performing your birth sex, marks you as aberrant and makes you vulnerable in this culture. Three, gender representation. A central focus of my research is looking at media representations and the formal, sorry, and the informal education they have on individuals and culture more broadly. The focus, for example, on the sexualised and objectified way that women have been presented in the media has been of key interest to feminists since the 1960s. While personally I don't subscribe to a monkey see, monkey do uh, view of the media, I've completely lost my spot, but that's something I do subscribe to. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe to a monkey see, monkey do view of the media. I do think that most media tends to present relatively homogenous messages on gender. For example, telling audiences that the most important thing a woman can be is young, thin, white and fornicatable and that these messages repeated over and over and over again have impact. The impact can range from women devoting excess resources to achieving this aesthetic, for men judging women who don't or for employees discriminating on appearance. When asked, most of us say we would like to see ourselves represented more on screen to see my more diversity in regards to age, ethnicity, body shape. But this topic is tricky. Most of the media we watch is about escapism. We buy magazines with people far more beautiful than us on the covers because we like looking at pretty pictures. In advertising, we gain generally buy products from the pretty people promising us prettier lifestyles. The fact that we're on average far more likely to go and see a film with a famous hot person at the helm underscores this. But what about in news? In news, do we always need to see the older stately man sitting next to a woman generally half his age? Why is her expiry date so much earlier than his? Of course, as feminists are always reminded, but it's not just about the women. <laughs> and of course, men don't get it easy in the media either. While I do believe that the spectrum of acceptable ages and body shapes for men is broader than women, Men in the media are still often expected to do masculinity in all the stereotypical ways. Strength, physicality, emotion, suppression, sex. I don't think we can pretend this repetitive presentation is disconnected from the masculinity concerns we have in our culture, be they manifested in school shootings, in terrorism, or in domestic violence, where rage gets expressed in unhealthy ways, and that perhaps that's partly caused by a culture that doesn't do a great job in teaching that there's actually many different ways to be a man. Lastly, I will talk very briefly about four internet in <laughs> maybe I won't if I can't say it. Intersectionality. It's a buzzword, and I don't drop if I don't drop it into every lecture, there'll always be a student who reminds me of it, commonly on social media for maximum impact. It's a topic that gets a lot of attention nowadays. I see it as both the future of feminism, but also its limitation. Intersectionality identifies all the things that exist beyond gender to create inequality. Life might be harder for you because of your gender identity, but compounding this might also be your age, your postcode, the colour of your skin, how much you earn, your religion, whether you're disabled, how much or how little education you've had. 
In practice, obviously, the experience of a highly educated white woman is going to be completely different to an elderly Bangladeshi garment worker. Feminism needs to be intersectional, absolutely. It's been too long dominated by discussions about what white educated women are worried about. But the other side to this is feminism can't be a catch-all. That rather than trying to cram everything under the feminism label, we need to recognise that there exists other political movements for different purposes. That feminism is primarily, primarily, about, gender in, primarily about gender equality. For people who don't put gender at the forefront of their identity, its appeals, in my view, will always remain limited. I look forward to your questions and counter-arguments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lots to think about there. Now we're going to hear from Professor Vincent Harley, who leads the Sex Determination and Godinal Development Research Group in the Centre for Endocrinology and Metabolism at the Hudson Institute of Medical Research. His work focuses on transcription factors and their role in health and disease, but also on establishing a biological basis for gender identity through genetic analysis of transgender individuals. He is an expert in molecular genetics, sex differentiation, organ development, and gene regulation. Please welcome Professor Harley. Jane. So um, yes, I'm a molecular geneticist. I'm interested in humans and genes and uh, I guess um, a key kind of confronting issue is um, in the maternity ward and the frequently asked question, is it a boy or a girl? And usually the answer is straightforward, but sometimes it isn't. And I'm very interested in, in that predicament um, of parents and um, the baby who was born intersex. So um, intersex uh, is a condition where either the chromosomes or the gonads, the gonads is a word that sort of means the testes and the ovaries, or the external genitals are not typically male or typically female. And um, sometimes they're, they're mixed and uh, I'll just talk a little bit about sex determination and I'll stick to mammals. Uh, so whether you're a boy or a girl typically depends on whether you've got a Y chromosome or not. So males have a Y chromosome and females don't. So that's, that's true for most mammals. Not even true for all mammals, but we don't have time to go into that. Um, and what the Y chromosome does is it turns the gonads into a testis. So up until about the week of week six in the human embryo, we're bipotential. We can become male or female. We've got the plumbing for both sexes and we've got gonads that can become testes or ovaries. If your gonads become testes, they'll secrete testosterone you'll be virilized, the embryo will be virilized and you'll be a male. If you don't have testes, you'll be a female. You don't need ovaries to be a female, but you can't have testes in general to be a female. These are the typical situations. So there's um, a whole pathway of genes that leads from that point where the gonads look identical to the point where they look like testes or ovaries. And at week six in the human embryo, a gene on the Y chromosome kicks, kicks into action, and that's called SRY. And I've been studying that for 25 years since it was discovered um, when I was a postdoc in London um, in our lab. So that triggers this cascade of gene expression, and a transcription factor is a thing that controls genes. It's a gene switch, and this thing is a gene switch that leads the bipotential gonads to become a testis and not an ovary. Um, but sometimes things don't go in a straightforward way, and there's a whole bunch of genes involved here, hundreds probably, and there are changes in these genes that occur in intersex patients so that the, um, the gonad doesn't become a, t a, a typical testis or a typical ovary. It might be that you have 
an ovary on one side and a testis on the other, or that you have a mixture of testis and ovary bits in the, single, in the same gonad, that's called an ovotestis, or it could be that one half of the gonad looks like a testis and the other half looks like an ovary. All of these things could manifest in a baby born with ambiguous genitals. And so sex externally on a baby um, can be ambiguous. Um, there's a grading score from a penis to a clitoris um, and there's sort of this stuff in between called micro penis and enlarged clitoris and they're, they're graded for the um, endocrinologists. Um, but that grading varies and an assignment of sex and that grading varies between cultures and it, and it varies between decades. So it's a fairly arbitrary assignment, if you like. The problem with that assignment is that it can have irreversible consequences if decisions are being made around surgery. And they have been. And those decisions, um, half the time, were wrong. Because in the old days, it was easier to make a hole than a pole. But not so much these days. Phalloplasty is a little easier. But there is a huge amount of um, mistakes in the past and there are still um, lawsuits in the courts because of so-called female genital mutilation, um, which has been taken up as human rights um, issues. So I'm very interested in trying to understand the genetics behind this because this may well inform things like gender identity, which I'll talk about in a minute. So um, understanding um, what makes, um, what the pathways are and trying to def define what they are um, will help us determine what to do. Now, to do. I actually think we, don't, we should do nothing um, if we don't have to do anything. And in most cases, it's not a medical emergency. There are some cases of intersex where it is, but most it isn't a, a, a medical emergency. So I think you just, um, and parents, at least clinicians often say that, it's, that there's a lot of pressure from the parents to assign and make the child physically look male or female as soon as possible. But until the gender identity of that child is known, until we know that that child identifies as male or female, there should never be um, surgery performed on that child if it's not necessary um, and, and defining the, the outward sex of that child. So the answer, I think, is to wait. And um, waiting till about the age of three seems to be about the age. Um, it's before school. And typically, children know what sex they are and, and demonstrate that. Um, and the reason I think that is that I also have um, met hundreds of trans sex people because I also work on the genetics of gender dysphoria or gender identity. And mainly trans women and the Monash Gender Clinic has um, seen thousands of cases over the last 40 years, previously at the Queen Victoria Hospital. So I've been collecting DNA for the last 20 years from these um, people and <coughs> met half of them, I reckon, say that they've felt different from as early as the age of three. So what is gender dysphoria? It's got lots of names. Um, Transsexuality is an easy one. Um, it used to be called gender identity disorder, but gender dysphoria is its common name, and trans. Um, and so people, you know, who are physically male but identify as female or vice versa or something in the spectrum. Um, and gender dysphoria runs in families. So if you have a monozygotic twin, there's a 40% chance the other will be. So there is probably a biological basis for it and a, a genetic basis and maybe a genetic and an environmental basis and an in interaction between those two things. Um, and there we don't know a lot about the biological basis. Um, there are a few studies that have been done and, and emerging studies, particularly MRI studies and brain imaging studies are starting to show that the male and female brains are different. There are regions which are um, different in size and for example there might be a region that's bigger in females than males and in trans women it's female size so trans women are uh, trans women are women who are born with a male birth sex but identify as women and there are brain regions that are 
female size in trans women. <coughs> Conversely, there are other regions that are male sized in trans men. So that kind of says there are some differences going on and there are some kind of histological sort of studies that suggest that there are differences as well. Um, and there are even other studies where it turns out when we smell sex hormones, um, different brain regions are activated in males and females and in trans women, um, the pattern of activation is, is like that of females. And this is the subconscious activation of brain regions using PET um, um, in response to sex hormones. So it's pretty hard to sort of fudge that sort of data. And I'm interested in, and so I think there's probably something to do with testosterone, testosterone and estrogen. And I've been looking at um, most recently 12 genes involved in making and processing sex hormone signals. Um, and I've just been looking at the genes and I've been looking at the variation in these genes in, in a population of 400 trans women and a population of 400 male controlled, roughly. And I'm seeing differences in those populations to suggest that there are genetic differences, although they're subtle and it's sort of population-wide that we're seeing them. So that's giving me some impetus to look more broadly at, um, at um, changes in, in um, genetic um, basis, if you like, for um, gender identity. Um, and uh, I think how valuable this is, I guess from a basic science level, we've always wondered what sex we, why we feel the sex we are. Um, for some um, trans people, particularly in um, develop developing countries, it can be quite difficult for their lives and, and some feel, and I've had hundreds of emails after publishing work, um, because I sort of showed the first sort of genetic basis for um, trans about 10 years ago, um, saying that it empowers them to know that there is a biological basis for their condition. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Harley. Now for something completely different. As an ichthyologist at the Museum Victoria, Diane Bray is involved in managing and developing natural history collections, contribu contributing to the research efforts of fish biologists working on Australian fishes worldwide. She is the co-editor and major contributor to Fishes of Australia's Southern Coast and the founder of the Fishes of Australia website. Please welcome Diane Bray. Thank you very much, and I think I'm in rather esteemed company here. Um, so I'll go on to my fish talk. I'm um, going to whiz through some of these slides. Um, fishes have got every sexual strategy, reproductive strategy covered, uh, from parthenogenesis to the most extreme form of sexual parasitism you have ever see. Um, uh -oh, this one's, I'm going to have to kind of peer around here. So why fishes? They've been around for about 500 million years. There's uh, 35,000 plus living species, which is more than all the other vertebrate groups combined. Um, a huge evolutionary radiation has occurred, especially in bony fishes, um, and so that they've um, radiated into all sorts of environments from the depths down to about 8,000 metres to high altitude lakes, um, extreme warm climates, desert regions where, you, where they live in really incredibly high temperatures um, down to uh, the frozen southern ocean. And they, as I said, they um, exhibit several forms of herma hermaphroditism. Um, many fish groups do that. Um, it appears that it's evolved more than once. Sex role reversal, uh, pipefishes and seahorses where the male seahorse in particular, the male seahorse, has a pouch where he broods the developing eggs and he not only gives them a home in that pouch but he actually produces, secretes some nutrients to um, help them on their way and then actually gives birth that looks like it's kind of painful. Um, and you can see examples of that online. And then there's the sexual parasitism in the uh, deep sea anglerfishes, which are amazing, those amazing amazing fishes with the light organs on their heads, fishing rods on their heads, um, and I'll go into that in a minute. And then parthenogenesis in some freshwater fish groups. So 
gonochrism, which is um, individual um, individuals are either male or female, is the most common um, most common mode that you'll find in fishes, separate males and females. That is by far and away the most common. But hermaphroditism ditchism is not uncommon. Most coral reef fishes, tropical coral reef fishes, many or most are hermaphrodites. Um, most of those hermaphrodites undergo a male and female sex change, uh, a sex change from female to male during their life cycle, or they are able to. It's not mandatory in some. Um, that's called protogyny. Male to female sex change is called protandry. And then there's also bidirectional sex change, where um, fishes can change once into one sex and then reverse that, which is pretty amazing. And as I mentioned, there's parthenogenesis, which is uncommon. Um, and some of the live bearers, which are um, little freshwater fish fishes, and it's also been shown in sharks in captivity that have never, ever been anywhere near a male. Um, the Amazon molly reproduces um, by a sperm-dependent parthenogenesis. So, so she will mate with, there are no males in this species, she will mate with a closely related species and the sperm will kick off the development. Um, Fertilisation doesn't occur, but the sperm will kick off the development of, little of um, her offspring. So essentially, they're all clones of each other. Um, um, so they're essentially producing just clones of each other, um, which is quite amazing. And that's a picture of them down there, those Amazon mollies down the bottom. So hermaphroditism. Se sequential hermaphroditism is, is the most common, where an individual will change sex from either male to female or female to male. Um, and protogyny, which begins with they animals, fishes begin life as a female and change into a male, is, is the most common form. All our, our wrasses, our beautiful blue gropers that are returning to Port Phillip <coughs> Bay, um, they were se severely overfished and they're coming back into the bay now. We've had pictures of lots of um, juveniles and females, but we haven't had a photograph of a big male yet. They live in a um, they live in a harem where you'll have a dominant male uh, guarding a territory with females and juveniles. If that dominant male disappears, um, they live in a hierarchical situation where there are real dominance in the hierarchy. If the dominant male disappears, the dominant female in that hierarchy will change sex over a period of several weeks to become a male. Um, so not all the females or juveniles will get to become males necessarily because there is this hierarchy. Um, but, and that really is a common strategy that um, many reef fishers from wrasses to the beautiful um, angel fishes in there also live in a harem. These beautiful basslets down here live in a harem. The sand perches live in a harem where a male essentially um, guards a territory and he has a, a group of females and juveniles. Um, our gropers, the largest, you know, our very large gropers, the largest ones are males. The smaller ones are females. Um, the males either, uh, they don't live in a harem, they either guard a territory, they often guard a territory where females will spawn. So they're actually getting to mate with, getting to, getting their sperm is not getting to mate, but they pass their genes on to uh, a number of females by dominating this, this particular territory. And... The fact that the males are the biggest and then the smallest, the, the smaller ones are females, and females will change into males. Um, it really, it really affects how we work on our fishing rules, regulations, and and size limits on fishes. If you're not, you know, in some things, you, in some fishes which change sex, you might be taking out all the bigger ones in the population. So you're taking out all the males or females. Or in gropers, you're taking the next level down. So you're reducing the size of the females. Um, so that really is, needs, is being taken into in terms of fishing regulations. Uh, what else have I got? Um, so in these harems, it's a socially mediated sex change. It's, it's not, a, it's not um, a genetic sex change where it will happen, where a female will definitely change into a male during her lifetime. Um, it's a socially mediated thing. Um, and again, in these harems, um, all these... Um, Basslets and the angelfishes take out the dominant male and the female will change sex into uh, a male over a period of weeks. The next one is protandry. Um, and so that's less common, male to female. Um, anemone fishes, our barramundi, popular thing that you might have on your plate from time to time. Um, the larger ones are females. Um, and finding Nemo got it completely wrong. Um, Nemo's dad 
Mar Marlin, was it Marlin, is a female. Um, they live in a, anemone fishes live in a symbiotic relationship with certain kinds of coral reef anemones. Um, they gain protection from that. They are immune to the nematocysts, providing they hang around the anemone. I think if you take an anemone fish away from its anemone for a long period of time, um, it will get stung, and so it's got to gradually develop that immunity again. Um, the largest in the social group of uh, one female, one male, and then a bunch of juveniles, uh, the female is the largest. And so, same situation. If, you, if the female disappears, um, everybody gets to move up in that particular hierarchy because the male will change sex over a period of few weeks in to become a female, and then the dominant juvenile gets to move up and become a reproductively active male. Um, and so you know, the Finding Nemo would have been a much more interesting movie had they <laughs> included that little bit of the life cycle in the movie. <laughs> Bidirectional sex change. There are um, a few fish groups this happens in, um, little coral dwelling gobies and some other gobies and hawk fishes. Um, these little gobies, coral gobies, one monogamous pair tends to live in a small little coral head. And if one of the pair disappears, that coral head, th that pair will always have a male and female, always have a male and female living in that coral head. So if a f the female disappears, um, there may be the odd juvenile hanging around that can either change sex to become a female. <coughs> Another individual may wander over from another coral head, but that's a dangerous proposition for these tiny little gobies. Um, <coughs> and sometimes you'll end up, they, they'll end up with two males in the coral head and one of them will change sex to become a female. Um, they've done experiments in, in the lab. Uh, they're tiny little, they're gorgeous little tiny gobies that are only a couple of centimetres long. Very difficult to watch them in the wild. In the lab, they can put two females into a coral head, take one away, and one of the um, put two females into a coral head, and one of them will change sex into a to become a male. Um, and they've shown that that can uh, individuals can actually reverse their sex change and turn back into a female, depending on the makeup of the coral head. And I don't know how they decide who wants to be who becomes the male or the female. It's a bit like Ursula Le Guin's *The Left Hand of Darkness*, if you've read that wonderful science fiction book. So juveniles can mature into either um, into either males and females, and then change back, change sex, um, reverse their sex, uh, depending on the makeup of the um, pair. Um, simultaneous hermaphrodites. So these are wonderful deep sea fishes. We were lucky enough. Martin Goman, who's a curator of fishes here, and myself were lucky enough to go be involved in a trip last year um, on your research vessel, the Investigator collecting in deep waters down to 4,000 metres of eastern Australia, and we caught all these kinds of fishes. These are deep water spider fishes. They have live in an incredibly harsh environment. We got many of them down in around 2,500 metres. So we've got a gridiron spider fish here with weird, weird plates on top of its head, sort of not really functionalised. Nobody really knows what they do with those things. Um, Tripod fishes, weird deep sea fishes that stand high off the bottom um, on their fins facing into the current. They've got wonderful um, fin rays that they face into the current and they can feel the oncoming prey. They've got really, really reduced eyes, so they're, they're not actually seeing their prey. They're actually sensing it in the water as it comes in. Um, <coughs> deep sea lizard fishes, really nasty, snaggly toothed things that really move mouths full of teeth that kind of do look a bit lizard-like. Um, and that's an amazing picture of a tripod fish up the top there. <coughs> they live in an incredibly harsh environment. Food's scarce. Um, animals are scarce. So um, having functional male and female tissue, an ovotestis, solves the problem of finding a mate. You've only got to find one fish. You don't have to find a particular fish of a particular gender. You've only got to find one other fish. Um, and Presumably, they're always compatible. Um, and so, and also, balance is the cost of um, that paternal and maternal energy allocation so that, you know, one fish is doing the, is, is producing eggs and sperm. 
um, studies have been done on some of them where they've caught enough of them to find that the fem the ovo that the ovary part of the ovo testis doesn't always have eggs, so um, making eggs is a lot more and it takes a lot more energy than sperm, but there's always sperm um, there. And finally, our wonderful, I think it's finally, um, our wonderful deep sea anglerfishes, the ceratioid anglerfishes. The anglerfish from Finding Nemo was based on one of these anglerfishes and there's a whole range of them up there. Females, um, <coughs> these, these guys live in the twilight zone, the meso mesopelagic dome below 3,000 metres out in the midwaters where there's nowhere to hide and an animal, um, most of the fishes are black and they have light organs on their head um, to attract play or light organs on their bodies to counter shade them or they, the anglerfishes have a light organ like a fishing rod on their head with bioluminescent lure. Sometimes it's amazing, it looks just, you know, we've got one upstairs, the, the lure looks just like a squid. Um, extreme sexual dimorphism, the males are tiny, the males look like tiny little tadpoles, often with big nostrils um, and strong swimming muscles and their sole aim in life is to find a female. In some of these groups, if they're lucky enough to find a female, well, they all latch on um, with, they've got denticles on the front of their jaws, they lose their teeth, they've got denticles. But in some of the groups, if they find a female, they latch on and they become permanently attached to her. The skin around their mouth fuse, gradually fuses with hers and the blood vessels come clo grow close together so that essentially she, um, whenever she's ready to release her eggs in the water, she's got testicles on her side, <laughs> ready to go. So... That this that anglerfish there, Haplophyne morris, which is a, called a half vent, uh, half leaf vent anglerfish or something. There, that's actually one of the anglerfishes in our collection, and you can see um, she's got a round knob. That, that round knob on her head is actually her fishing lure, tiny little thing. But you can see that she's got this gorgeous little tiny male attached to her. You can see his eyes. <laughs> Um, she's actually got another one attached near her fin, so she actually has two males attached to her. So, and you can see the illustration down the, on the uh, far right-hand side there is an illustration of males of several species attached. And the skin literally fuses, um, fuses to her skin. So this is, you know, the most amazing reproductive strategy, whereas when you're ready to reproduce, you don't have to go and find anybody because you've got <laughs> a little sperm bank <laughs> stuck on the side of your body. Um, <laughs> And there's, you know, there's lots of questions because no, you can't keep, these things can't be kept alive. Um, they've come up alive and in fact I'll show you a video from one thing, I'm going over time here. But, you know, how do males find the females? Um, one, one larger anglerfish was found to have nine males attached to her and one anglerfish was found to have a male of a different species. So, so how on earth is their immune system shut down so they're not actually, um, they're not actually um, rejecting these males? Um, and then how do the nutrients pass through? And if you don't believe me, I'll just show you this. This is a male, you guys might want to see this. I, um, this is a male anglerfish um, that was filmed last, last year, I think. And she's got a male, female anglerfish. She has a male, you can see that little male attached to her on the, on the bottom of her body. Um, and she's amazing. She's got these uh, incredible fin rays. They're not sure whether they're bioluminescent or not, and a little lure. Um, and you can see that male just hanging around there. <laughs> I'm not sure how long this goes on. It might go on a little bit too much. Ooh, I didn't know that. Okay, I might just move this on. Uh, I don't know how to finish it. And then, okay. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you want to find out more about our amazing fish fishes, um, check out that website. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Diane. That was intriguing. And I never, I mean, there's obviously no room for gender politics in the fish world. I mean, anything goes. <laughs> well, it's probably a, um, a rather kind of naive question, but is there any cause, I mean, uh, we are linked to fish in the evolutionary trail, um, you know, chain. Um, maybe you too, Vincent, might have a thought on this. Is, is there any way of linking these kinds of 
gender, this gender diverse, wide gender diversity and, and, and adaptability in the fish world to us? Well, I guess they are the most, most um, earliest evolved vertebrates. Um, but we do have our inner fish inside of us genetically. I don't know how much of our genetic makeup is still there from the fish world. Um, you might be able to answer that question. Um, lots of it. So there are heaps of genes and, and different fish species do sex completely different ways with completely different chromosomal bases. You know, sometimes it's an XY, it's not SRY, but it's, it's a whole bunch of other genes which are ancient. There are lots of ancient genes in us which are very similar to fish genes and in fish they are sex determining genes. Mm, interesting. Wow. So can you um, also elucidate a bit for us? I think you very modestly failed to mention that you have found a genetic link. Uh, in fact, um, you said, I think, when we spoke prior to this evening that um, you had found a genetic link um, which was a sort of signal gene um, that, that kicked off testosterone in um, males but was not doing so in trans, um, uh, trans women. Um, yes, it's a receptor for testosterone. And um, if you look, um, it's not so um, clear and direct as a this va variation in the receptor causes transsexualism. It's not like that. It's, a, it's, it's, it's probably many, many genes and other factors. So we're never going to get a test, a genetic test for transsexualism. It's too complex, like height, generally. There is no test that will tell you how high you're going to be. Um, but we did look at a population of um, trans women and a population of, of male controls, and we looked at the spectrum of variation in the receptor, and there's quite a broad spectrum of variation um, that, that occurs just in, uh, in typical males. And when you look at that spectrum in a population of, of trans women, it's the, it's the normal distribution more or less, and it's shifted. So it's shifted to a, a form of the receptor that doesn't process a testosterone signal very well, at least when we do it in a, in a culture dish in, in a laboratory. So uh, that doesn't mean that's the way it happens with us. We don't even know what part of the brain specifies our gender identity yet. But there's been a lot of, there is a lot of work going on in this field, isn't there? There's quite a lot of groups that are working on this now, and including, and we've continued, and we're doing bigger studies that support that idea of sex hormone signaling um, playing a role. But there, we haven't done an unbiased method, meaning we've only looked at a dozen genes. We haven't looked at 25,000 genes, and we're about to embark on um, genome-wide analysis. Mm, okay. Now, uh, you also um, touched uh, uh, during your talk on the impact, you know, some of, some, some of the impact is vi vi environmental, some is biological. Could you just tease that out a bit? What might be the environmental factors that, that um, determine gender diversity? Um, I think that might have to do, it's, it's not well understood, it, but it might have to do with the um, maternal environment. And, I mean, in the old days, people thought it was to do with childhood trauma. Now, I don't know if there's any basis for childhood trauma playing a role. Um, uh, I know a little more about sex determination and env environment um, when it comes to um, fish or, uh, more recently, um, the bearded dragon in central Australia, which has been influenced. And its genetic sex-determining mechanism seems to be affected being affected by climate change, and it's switching from a temperature-based sex-determining mechanism. Temperature is a common mechanism for sex determination in um, turtles and um, crocodiles, for example, and, and um, certain lizards. And these dragons are um, seem to be the where, where the change and the switch from one mechanism to the other is occurring is a place where, in central Australia, is a region where climate has changed a degree or so mm. over, I don't know how long it's been, but so, so it's, um, there are sort of other more rapid instances of this occurring in alligators in the Florida swamps, which are being exposed to environmental estrogens that leach out of plastics. Plastics. And out of plastics, yeah. 
BPAs, for example, and that seems to be changing the sex ratio, um, and, and that could well have broader implications on the animal kingdom. Mm. As, as, as the temperature dependent um, sex determination in lizards, you, you, you end up with a gender bias mm. in the population. And again, it's what we're seeing in your, in your world, it's, it's kind of a strategy for survival, isn't it? It's but they are enormously adaptive. Well, if they are so adaptive, and we're also, again, coming out of reptiles as well, I think, a few of those in our closet, um, perhaps, I mean, is there any argument for saying that we are also um, going through a process of adaptation or something? I don't, I don't know. Um, I do fish. You do I'll fish? <laughs> well, cop, I'll is cop it, is out it beyond the bounds of possibility <laughs> that... that I think there is, there is definitely, um, definitely research around um, environmental toxic toxicants and estrogens and their effects on ADHD, for example, and other conditions. Mm. Okay, all right. Well, we'll get, a, get away from the science on which I'm obviously incredibly flaky. Um, and perhaps ask Lauren. I um, failed year 10 science, so <laughs> don't ask me about fish. No, no, we won't go there. I think we've, we've uh, got a lot to think about in the world of fish. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, it was all fairly, um, you know, fairly depressing, uh, your talk, in a way. Well... That's what I bring. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 the world seems so complicated in terms of, of gender, and um, I think you're indicating that, and it's true, you know, that feminism is an evolving story, uh, and without feminism, however, perhaps... Uh, homosexuality would not have been addressed, we wouldn't have legalised that situation, perhaps we wouldn't be here today talking about gender politics. So, I mean, one debate leads to another. Uh, what I'm trying to sort of argue, is there not a pattern? Uh, are we not maybe taking a few steps forward and one back? But are, are we, in fact, getting somewhere? I mean, we are, in fact, addressing these issues and we are talking about them. So, isn't that cause for some optimism? <laughs> I'm not sure how much uh, credit I'm going to give feminists for um, progress in regards to homosexuality. I say that because there's a lot of frictions between the two camps, um, particularly if it's male homosexuals and feminists of the sort of old guard, they haven't always had a happy marriage. Equally, some of the most, the biggest developments in progressive um, homosexual rights actually came from trans women and drag queens. So the idea that they, they were groups that feminists were actually traditionally hostile towards. So I'm not sure that the leap, if we're going to make a connection, I would say that if anyone knows marginalisation, it's women. So there's that link there. And certainly um, the feminist movements fed into other kinds of civil rights movements, particularly in the 60s and 70s. I don't think we've got very good examples of a united front. They kind of worked in their own camps. So I'm going to answer your question with a yeah. Sort of. The other aspect, though, is the two steps forward, one step back. That's definitely, if I've got my political science hat on, we know that the pendulum is constantly swinging. So I think that, um, the you know, we saw a backlash against the successes of the second wave of feminism in the 1980s, where you saw media be very hostile towards feminism and you saw women retreat from feminism really quickly because it was associated with the... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the dark stereotype, you know, the hairy-legged, burnt your bra kind of negative reputation that women didn't want to be attached to. So women sort of ran from feminism in the 80s. You saw women re-embrace it in the 90s and then I think there was some more progress, but I think the election of, uh, of Donald Trump kind of highlights that with a whole lot of successes that came with race and with gender, there are a whole lot of people who were bitter about that and that resentment needed a voice, needed a voice and came out in really, really hostile ways. And I think that this, the legacy for me of the Trump regime, it, regime is going to be that a whole lot of things that were completely unacceptable for a decade have now got a legitimacy that's... Uh, <laughs> sanctioned by the White House and I think that that even when he eventually gets out of office that stays suddenly a voice to hatred and a voice to progress be it same-sex rights uh, 
race, gender, that's all gone a bit backwards because there were people who were resentful that some people got a leg up. So that's one of these pendulum swing things. Hopefully, if that pattern follows, he leaves office and we get someone who's amazingly progressive. We saw that happen in New York uh, this morning. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, we are adaptive too, just like fish. Just like fish. Right, well, look, I think I'll... Um, yes, we've got a question there already. I'm going to uh, throw questions open to the floor now. And uh, we have a couple of volunteers, I think, with uh, roving mics. So please put your hand up and they will find you. Please also keep your questions brief and to the point. And um, no statements or rants, please. Questions <laughs> is what we're after. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope... Thank you. Um, I hope I've understood this correctly. Professor Harvey, was it? I'm sorry. Harvey. Um, if I've understood your comment correctly, it has quite important implications because if, you're, if there is a biological basis for transgender identity and behaviour, does it follow that there's also a biological basis for what I guess we regard as more conventional uh, gender roles, you know, for, the, for the more typical type of male and female roles that we associate with it? Is there a biological basis for those types of behaviour and identity. And as a sort of supplementary, um, you said that mixed gonad development um, manifests in observable external um, differences. But is it possible that where there is mixed gonad development, there is no visible external difference? And does that possibly have some help, help us in our understanding of same-sex attraction? Wow. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, First, the first point about gender identity, I think, um, yes, because we talk about male and female identities and being a geneticist, we're always looking for a homogeneous population. So I'm just focused on the, the extreme ends. Those are the people that are so distressed that they go, you know, seeking um, sex reassignment surgery. So there's a whole spectrum back from there that I haven't been analysing. So... Um, I think it, it's not a binary either, uh, but I've taken the, you know, I've taken the groups that are defined in a in a clinical setting, if you like. And many trans people elect not to have surgery, and you know, and, and same with intersex people. So it's not the only um, the only solution. Um, mixed gonads. Um, so. So often, um, what at least we, know, we we don't really know that much in humans because we only see the end result when the child is born. But we know quite a bit in mice, and, and even in my lab we've seen this, where you get an overtestis in the embryo, and it depends on the proportion of male and female cells. As tip, usually one one end will die off, and you'll end up with a small testis or, or a small ovary, which will mean an undervirilized, possibly a virilized, because you don't need much testis. You don't need much sperm either to be fertile um, uh, or, or uh, um, an under feminized um, female so that's kind of how it can manifest so we think although we don't understand very well in human development um, that an over test is commonly will, will resolve into one or the other and, and yes you may not see um, uh, a change um, outwardly a and the other main group of um, intersex people are, are females that present at puberty, um, failing to menstruate, and, and this group are discovered to have a Y chromosome. So outwardly, they are perfectly female, uh, carrying a Y chromosome. Yes, I think there's a question up there at the back. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is kind of about the... Um, the relationship between scientific discovery and uh, civil discourse around transsexuality. I was wondering what effect you thought uh, looking for biological factors to transsexuality had on the debate around um, uh, trans rights, essentially. Who's your question for? Um, both of the people in the middle. <laughs> yes, I think we can look at that pretty quickly. Um, uh, look, I, I, I'm not... Um, a sociologist. I, I can only go from hundreds of emails of people who've, trans people who've mm -hmm. written to me. So, um, and the the overwhelming 
feeling is that, um, particularly in societies where it's shunned, um, that to, to be able to present that to the, to the you know, politicians and lobby, you know, and lobby around that it is, is important. I think it's a yes sort of but answer. Um, partly you have this justification that if there's a biological, if there's a gene that I can point to, I have no choice and therefore it becomes akin to race or to other things where there's been marginalisation and you say, well, this isn't a choice, this isn't a lifestyle choice, therefore respect be based on the grounds of I was born this way. And for some homosexuals, for example, the idea of uh, belief in a biological uh, answer to that has given a sense of, of, of identity and an out of my handsness. My problem with that is that seems to be a response to church groups and to conservatives who say, well, if you've chosen this lifestyle, you can unchoose it, as opposed to saying, hang on, I'm human and respect me. So I think that there is for some people a sense of solace if you're not particularly politically minded but actually want to know have your val your identity validated and to be able to say, well, this isn't actually in your head, you, it's not in your head in, in that sort of um psychological problem aspect but rather here's a biological basis for it I think on an individual level there's an element of uh, reassurance that you're not alone that you fit into this rich tapestry of genetics and therefore that gives you a sense of, of identity I think politically though the idea of saying we always need a gender uh, uh, sorry a genetic basis to earn rights causes me problems equally I start to fear and this is when I've got my <laughs> dystopia hat too much handmaid's tale but with my <laughs> dystopia hat what will happen with this information do we then get the technology that says well we can have prenatal testing being trans is going to be difficult for my child or being intersex is going to be difficult for my child I'd rather not actually go through with that pregnancy and then I start to think well and then I go a bit crazy, but this doesn't always have a good outcome for me. So I, I'd like to see us earn, you know, people earn respect based on the fact that they're human and everyone deserves dignity, as opposed to saying you only get it if I can find you on a Petri dish. I'm sure you don't use Petri dishes. I don't really know about science, but <laughs> let's just pretend Petri dishes <laughs> and Bunsen burners are involved because that's the... <laughs> That's the last time I had any involvement with science and I got a 17% on my test and that's it. You 10. I agree. I don't. It's, it's not essential um, uh, to 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 know if there is a biological basis or whether or not it is a lifestyle choice. Um, it's you know it doesn't. It, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that it comes to that. And most of the empowerment is not coming from the Western world, from my um, experiences. Uh, my question was about, um, sorry I'm over here, <laughs> um, my question was about intersex people at birth and uh, what laws, if any, are there to protect those people um, against surgeries that you named as unnecessary in most cases um, and against sex assignment at birth, you know, before yeah, so they know. In Australia, I think the decisions have been taken out of the clinician's hands and are the are in the courts, so the family court makes decisions uh, um, with the parents in, uh, in mind about um, around surgery, which is problematic for the parents as well because it costs ten or twelve thousand dollars, and there are subsidies. But there are issues that I'm not a clinician; I'm a scientist. But there are there are issues around that as well. We're talking a lot about babies when they're born. I'm an obstetrics registrar and I deliver lots of babies. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about sex assignment before babies are born, as you talked about. There's a condition called a congenital adrenal hyperplasia where girls are born with ambiguous genitalia and it can be diagnosed antenatally and the mother can be treated with dexamethasone if they want to have a baby who is phenotypically girl as well as genetically girl. This is, in my mind, a form of sex assignment as well. What do you think about this medical assignment of gender rather than just surgical? Um, I'm not a clinician, but are there, um, are there other 
symptoms of having this ex having this exposure to excess testosterone that go beyond the intersex salt wasting for example aren't there other indications for which the testosterone is lowered that are I work on the, the um, conditions where we don't know the genetic basis and we're trying to discover it. Um, but, but you're right, I mean, it, it is sex assignment in the same way as um, killing females, c killing female babies in China is sex assignment. It's been going on for mi millennia. Lauren, do you have a, a view on this, on, an ethical view on, on this sort of thing? Given that I've just heard about it, I'm trying to work through in my mind um, Partly I start to get nervous because of discussions around what happens with hormone treatment and long-term effects of that. So firstly, I'd say if you're pumping the baby, oh, I shouldn't say pumping the baby, um, <laughs> with my <laughs> science lexicon, um, uh, high doses of, of estrogen, let's say, we there are research that's looking at long-term excess estrogen across the life course and therefore what the links there are to certain kinds of cancers. So my my fear there would be we've solved one problem and created another one. I'd like to, to know more about this. It seems fascinating. Um, it's a horrible decision, I think, for parents to be put in and it's kind of the same as these decisions around intersex, why parents do make these decisions. So we can start with a clear and, you know, the binary can start being... Um, employed early as possible. I, I hadn't heard of this before you mentioned it. I find it fascinating. And in the academic answer, I'd like to know more. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, look, one of the problems when I look at stuff in, say, the Old Testament or in some newspaper reports of cases where people have gone as far as the High Court to get their sex as shown on their birth certificates, um, amended, um, wouldn't it be a lot simpler to just label people by their carrier type like 45X for a um, uh, Turner syndrome or um, um, various other things because that would step right away from the problem some people have where they're asked their gender on a form and given M or F alternatives whereas decades ago it used to be sex. Couldn't we just delete the box? How many forms is it actually ever relevant to know someone's sex or gender? I sit on the eth I chair an ethics committee at the University of Melbourne and nine, more than nine times out of ten, we actually say to the researchers, you're just doing that out of default of putting the sex on a survey form, for example, but in fact you're not doing anything with the data in which case delete it. Now we've got passports that are based on eye recognition. They're not looking at your gender. There's gone are the days where we're doing a, you know, the customs guide doing a once over. And then, you know, do you look male enough or female enough? I think the vast majority of purposes, you could get rid of that form and not need the question at all and not create half the dramas we have around paperwork. Yeah, well, I've got a science background and I tend to think of things like carrier types. So yeah, you've made an extremely good point. Just delete it. In some countries, the customs people aren't that modern and um, there needs to be something on the forms to dissuade them from getting uppity. Right. Thank you. Any more questions? I can't quite see. Here's my notes. Dr. Rosewan, I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing. Um, you, you um, stuck more on the nurture side and the gender side in your presentation and, and you said um, while you acknowledge there's hormones, biology, testosterone and other things that uh, could be uh, influential, you said it's much more interesting as the looking at the cultural elements. Mm. And I wonder if you could though touch on those less interesting elements. You see, for me, what, what appealed to me coming here today was the balance between nature versus nurture and you focus very much on the nurture and vice versa, Professor. Um, you talked about um, until we know if the child identifies male or female around the age of three and you talked about it more from the nature perspective but to what degree would you say there is a nurture element 
in the first three years of the child's life. Thank you. Generally, I don't like to feign expertise in areas that aren't my own, despite the academic job. Um, obviously, when I teach gender studies, I'm focusing on social, political, cultural uh, issues because that's what I've spent 15-odd years researching. I do acknowledge in most lectures that there is going to be biological components of everything I'm saying. For example, there's no point me talking about, as I mentioned in my talk, the gender pay gap, right? And pretend that that's not connected to biology. It's connected to biology because at the moment, the vast majority of people are having babies are women. It's women who are taking time out of the labour force. It's women who are disproportionately lactating. It's women who are raising those children. And the thinking that we need equality in that regard, we still can't basically have men having the babies. So that reality has enormous ramifications when we talk about lifetime earnings for women. That's a biological reality. So I can sit here and say, well, if we were only a better culture that had more even distribution of household labour, for example, things would be better. If only universities were more inclined to promote people on the basis of other things other than just publications, then women wouldn't have as many our consequences of career interruption, right? They're all things that we can talk about, but at the end of the day, biology is still an important component of that that doesn't just get wished away by talking about, you know, too many pink toys, too many blue toys, training bra bras for girls at Target and all the other stuff that social scientists and um, cultural studies researchers like me focus on. Rather, at the end of the day, there are going to be some things that are a bit more difficult to overcome. So... It's not as though we ignore it, it's just that it's not my area of expertise. Um, so, uh, moving into an area that's not my area of expertise as well, I, I think of a book by a Rolling Stone editor, um, John Colapinto, called As Nature Made Him, which was about a, um, a clinician from a, New a Kiwi clinician at Johns Hopkins in the 70s called John Money. I don't know if people know the situation, but he. He had the theory that, um, you know, just give me a baby and, um, and, and just love it, raise it as one sex or the other and don't tell it what it was um, born as and it will be fine. And it was with that kind of philosophy that surgery occurred in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and that case, there was a, then a, a, a case turned up where there were two twin boys and one of them was underwent a botched circumcision and lost his penis and they went ahead um, and removed his testicles as well. And he was, uh, John Money was advising this um, uh, Bruce Brenda um, pair uh, or the parents of them to raise um, um, Brenda um, as a girl and she'll be fine. And there was positive publications occurring over the first decade or so that Brenda was fine. but. Later, Brenda was not fine and reverted back to being a, a boy and a, a very a, a male and a very unhappy male who who committed suicide later on. There's some sm similar studies on kibbutzes in Israel where they had some projects there where the children weren't going to be raised with gender, that they weren't going to be given gender-specific toys. And the end of the study basically says <laughs> that after uh, six months' time, the, the boys had fashioned guns out of sticks and the girls had created things to nurse. And, you know, I hate those studies. <laughs> they, they revolt me. I don't want to... It, it completely conflicts with all of my interest in toy commercials. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that study is often referred to because again it's this this idea that um, uh, aggression in, you know that there's a genetic that there's a biological component to some of this stuff that it's not just um, too much television work by psychologist Melissa Hines at the University of Cambridge that studied um, a boy uh, play and there are theories around early boy play and the origins of male homosexuality and transsexuality being the same um, which are controversial, at, uh, but there are similar origins in, in that play. Okay, any more questions? Uh, yes, there are a couple here, Maeve. Uh, hi, just a question for the third speaker, um, getting away from humans for a little while. Um, we talked about um, sequ sequential hermaphroditism. 
Um, I guess I've got two questions. The first one's pretty quick. Um, do you know of any examples in fish species that exhibit um, sexual dimorphism? S most of the fish you tended to speak about didn't. Um, and the second part of the question is sort of what is it that changes in the individual um, as they undergo the change? Is it, do they change at a genetic level? Is it brain chemistry? Is it hormones? Or do we not know? Uh, your first question, many fishes exhibit sexual dimorphism. Um, sometimes the male will be larger. Depen it depends on the depends on the makeup of the group. If it if it's um, in some individuals, a male will be larger than a female. Um, it just depends on the the social setting of the group. Like the all those things that change. The males are if they change into a uh, depending on which which is the terminal phase. A terminal phase male is always bigger than the female, and vice versa. Um, finding Nemo's mum is always bigger than the male um, and the, the, the sexual dimorphism in those um, anglerfishes is just extreme you know that's an extreme form of sexual dimorphism because obviously she can't she can't carry around something that's almost as big as herself um, the second question um, I did a bit of reading on this but I I am no expert and I it's a whole range of hormonal and neurological and um, genetic and I'm the eyes <laughs> the eyes have it <laughs> um, I'm going to flick this question to this wonderful professor beside me because I know he knows a little bit about fish. Um, I, I don't know that much about fish, but there are some species where um, they can look at themselves in a mirror and change sex and what and the Japanese groups particularly are good at this and, and they, they track the activity of neurons from the eyes back to the gonads that release gonadotropins that change their sex of the testes, uh, of the gonads and then the fish. Yeah, fishes just shows you that gender really is a fluid thing. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, okay, look, well, we'll take one last question here from the chap in the red jacket there. Hi, uh, this question is for Dr. Rose Warren. I personally am, uh, have had a bit of a um, uh, war against gender norms in, in terms of I think it's far too heavy-handed. I would just like to, especially after that conversation, the question that was just posed, to hear your perspective on given that they are present in, in studies where you stand on how society should see them and, and how we can combat the, especially the aggressive aspects of them? Yes, a study that I was looking at recently was talking about how one of the successes of feminism that we take for granted now in 2018 is feminism taught women that there is a million different ways to be a woman that you can be strong, you can be an engineer, you can be a mother, and that that's all good. You can cry, you can not cry, you can wear lipstick, you can not wear li lipstick. This never happened for men. We never had this moment in fem you know, obviously it wasn't feminine, we don't care about the men, but that <laughs> no one was doing this work for men. No one was teaching boys that there are lots of different ways to be a man. So what you end up having is primary school kids who the boy who doesn't want to play sport is bullied or considered the weirdo. And these things that there isn't um, a culture, we haven't got a culture yet that's worked out how to deal with this. How do we say, and you know, it's easy to say, oh, boys can cry, etc. It's so much deeper than that and so much more complicated. For example, the idea of aggression. Culturally, we've sent a lot of mixed messages around aggression. We love it on the football field. We love it when it's some act of, you know, amazing bravery. Yet, on the other hand, we'll say aggression is bad and risk-taking behaviour is negative. So there's a lot of cultural mixed messages around masculinity that, on one hand, prizes certain co qualities in certain contexts, but then says men switch that off when you get home. But we've not given you the tools how to do it. So I think in terms of our cultural project going forward, it's this. It's working out, well, there are some truisms or, you know, uh, testosterone isn't something you get to wish away, isn't something that we get to say, well, you know, if feminism wins all its victories, we'll smother that feminine, you know, uh, we'll smother that testosterone. That's not ideal either. What we need to do is work out, well, what are the w more positive outlets for this? How do we channel it into something good? Because I don't think it's a coincidence where you see, for example, I mentioned high school shooters, terrorists. We talk in a culture a lot around these topics and talk about violence, anger, religion. We don't tend to talk about gender. <laughs> we seem to forget that there's a commonality here of angry men who are feeling disconnected for any number of reasons from their culture, but yet it manifests in really similar ways using whatever tools they've got at their disposal. So in a 
America, if you can go into 7-Eleven and buy a gun, I'll use a gun. But if I'm in a culture where guns are hard to get, I will use other things. It might, um, it, it might manifest in domestic violence. It might manifest in renting a car and driving it through a group of pass uh, a group of pedestrians. So I think that's our fu uh, our future project what we've done successfully in feminism in terms of broadening the definition of gender and the understanding of how to do gender, we need to do that with, me with men. Okay, that's a nice positive... Um, there you go, and you yeah. were saying I was such a negative exactly. person. <laughs> right, okay, you came good. So you depressive. Came good. <laughs> Thank you, came good at the end. Thanks to all our panellists. Uh, it's been the most engaging and uh, wide reaching conversation, everything from um, fish looking in the mirror and not liking what they see to uh, <laughs> a new campaign for liberating men. So, uh, could you please all thank, thank Diane Bray, <laughs> Tressa Harley and Dr. Wan. certainly a hard act to follow, so I won't be talking <laughs> about gender at all, but I'd just like to reiterate uh, the thank you that we've just heard. I think that we can all say that we've well and truly achieved our objective tonight about taking an important and current issue, picking it apart from lots of different perspectives and bringing uh, some new light to the issue. So thank you again for that fantastic discussion. Um, we do have two more events in this series, the Creating Space for Relevant Debate series coming up this year. The next one is on the 29th of August and is called Representing the Holocaust. Then we have another, um, the 31st of October, which is an Oxford-style debate on the topic Corporate Social Responsibility is Just a PR Tool. So if you'd like to hear more about our Humanities 21 events and our joint events with the museum, um, feedback forms were distributed to you on your way in. So take a couple of minutes, please, to fill that out and hand it to one of our volunteers on your way out. You can give us your name and your email and we'll make sure you hear about more things like this. Um, I'd like to now announce the winner of our social media competitions. So some free double passes to Nocturnal will go to... Um, Mark underscore in underscore Melbourne from Instagram. <laughs> Mark, don't worry, you don't need to come up. We'll get your email afterwards. Great. You're going to Nocturnal for free. That's awesome. Um, Facebook, Kel Lai or L Y Lee. Kelly? Good. And congratulations. Um, and oh, Twitter. We didn't have enough engagement on Twitter to pick a winner. Sorry about that. Okay, well. You too can have free passes to Nocturnal and the rest of you will see on your feedback forms there's a code there for you to use to get discounted tickets. Um, look, I'd like to say thank you not just with words but with gifts to our speakers. So uh, we've got our two fantastic volunteers, Nikki and Ilaria, coming to give you a token of our appreciation for tonight. I think they deserve another round of applause. And look, before I send you all out into the cold winter night, I just want to say a couple of things um, about Humanities 21. Our organisation promotes humanities education because we believe that it fosters a society in which people are open-minded and flexible and able to think critically and exhibit the kinds of skills that we've seen tonight. Um, part of our program is these public events. We also do programs in schools which extend bright students and we give them prizes for their original work and public speaking opportunities which fosters their own development and confidence in the humanities being a foundation for a fantastic career. Uh, we also have a corporate lecture series which again showcases how wonderful the humanities are as a basis for many different avenues of work. Um, it also encourages a respect for people who've studied the humanities and, and yeah I think really the corporate lecture series shows that having an understanding of history and literature and philosophy and all the other wonderful things encompassed by the humanities does really help you to understand your world and the way things are working now, the way things may unfold in the future based on our understanding of the past. Um, so I think that's about it from me. I'd really like to see uh, some more of your faces at events in future, so please do sign up and consider becoming a member. We offer annual memberships from $40 and you get a discount on your tickets to all of our events, as well as knowing that you're supporting us 
in making this mission possible. Just on closing, Aristotle did say that it was the marker of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And I think we need more people who think this way in our community. So if you'd like to join Humanities 21 in striving to make a community that contains people like that, then hopefully we'll see you again. Good night. <laughs>